Welcome, friends. It's wonderful to have you join us this morning or this afternoon or this evening or the middle of the night, depending upon where you are, for this special opportunity with Rex Ambler, who is the creator of the Experiment with Light Meditation. And we'll, we'll do the meditation, the full 40-minute meditation during this webinar. And we'll also hear from Rex about what he learned from early friends and how he created the meditation. For those of you who might not know, uh, Rex Ambler is a prolific Quaker author, especially known for making the wisdom of early friends available to friends today. He created the practice called Experiment with Light, and he also has helped to create um, what are called light groups. These are groups that meet on a regular basis to practice the Experiment Light Meditation together, and there are many groups that have been going for many years. He's taught this practice around the world. He's also been a university professor and a political theologian and helped establish the Gandhi Foundation in Britain. He's written a lot of books, um, but this one, Light to Live By, is a, is a short, wonderful book that explains the experiment with light meditation and what he learned from early friends about it. He's also written The Quaker Way, A Rediscovery, and Truth of the Heart, which is an anthology by George Fox of passages selected by Rex Ambler. And all of these are, are wonderful resources for friends today. So thank you so much for agreeing to um, be with us today, Rex, and um, we'd love to hear from you now. Well, thank you for that introduction, Marcel. And it's good to see you all and to be able to talk about the experiment that has been very dear to my heart for the last 20 odd years. I wasn't wasn't quite expecting this. I was ex expecting to be a relatively anonymous member of this uh, course. Um, but then I, I, I knew Marcel from before. In fact, uh, Marcel, you attended a course I did, one of the very first long, week-long courses on the experiment of light, didn't you? When I did it at Pendle Hill, I think in 2003 or 2004. And then um, the following year, you assisted me in actually teaching that course, again at Pendle Hill, and you've been teaching it since. So it has taken off in North America, um, has its own sort of leaders and, and uh, guides and its own network of communication. And you can find out about all that from um, the network. And I think towards the end, Marcel, you're gonna put up the details about that uh, website where people can get the resources they might want. So, yeah, let, let me just introduce you then to my own personal discoveries and how the whole thing began, which takes us back some 20 to 25 years. Um, uh, there won't be time to say more than that, really. Um, I have written about these things, as, as Marcel has said, so you'll be able to follow it up. So let me um, talk about how the thing first arose for me, the interest which really sparked me to, uh, to think about this. I would say it began when I felt a certain dissatisfaction with the process that I was actually experiencing in a Quaker meeting about 25 years ago or so. I remember consciously thinking, here I am sitting in a Quaker meeting with big questions on my mind about my life, about human life, about where we're all going. And I'm not feeling that I have the resources here to deal with these problems. I'm getting quite a lot of inspiration and encouragement from other friends, um, but I'm not getting the revelations that I need uh, to see my life clearly or the, the resolution to the conflicts I'm actually experiencing. And so uh, that was a time of crisis for me. And that took me back to the early friends. I asked myself, whether they really had something that we might have lost. I could see that from reading them that they had certainly found something pretty powerful. Uh, and it was clear and strong and enriching enough for them to say, we will stake our life on this, whatever they do to us. And 
what they did to them was horrendous, as you know. They were persecuted very severely, both in England and even later in the States, which uh, were only just becoming the States at the time. Um, there was something quite unacceptable to mainline Christianity in the way Quakers were doing their spiritual life, doing their Christianity. Um, so what was it, I asked myself, that made them so confident about this and gave them such clarity of mind and vision? It wasn't easy reading those early Quakers. Um, and it should have been easier for me because, yeah, I'm a, a, a theologian. I was teaching theology at the university and I knew a bit about, quite a lot, in fact, about the 17th century uh, in which that movement began. But still, I found it difficult. Um, the histories of the Quakers did not on the whole explain to me what this source of power and insight was. I suppose that's not the business of historians, is it? Um, but then other writers, even the wonderful Patricia Loring, um, did not have access to that early writing so that she could articulate what that was about. Nobody could. I read a number of um, writers who, who might have helped, Douglas Steer, Howard Brinton, and so on. Um, and I realized it was genuinely forgotten and somewhat inaccessible. So how was I going to find out? Well, I found my clues in those epistles that um, George Fox wrote to friends to encourage them, or that he wrote to the country in general, the world in general, indeed, which he was brave enough to do sometimes, um, to explain what they had to do. And that was it. Ah, he's, uh, he's suggesting, not that they believe something or follow a teaching, but they do something. Turn to the light within, he said. There you will discover the seed within you. And out of this, you will experience life. And if you open yourself to it, submit to it, you will have power. Wow. I thought, this is extraordinary, but what, what does he actually mean by all this? Um, that, that was a real puzzle. There, there was some writing by Hugh Barber. I think in New England, you must all know of Hugh Barber, because he must be very old now. Um, but he wrote some good things early on, like The Quakers in Puritan England, and his recent edition of Early Quaker Writings, which is a very good new introduction which he, he discusses all this. I've talked with him about it and myself and learned from it. There were clues to the effect that what the early Quakers were doing was something similar to what modern novelists and psychologists might be doing. That is helping people to recognize the truth about their life. Now, Hugh couldn't explain quite how they did this, but it was enough to get me on the trail, as it were. So I looked through these things and I began to notice, this was the breakthrough, I began to notice that what George Fox was recommending in these epistles was that people undertake some kind of a process which we today would describe as a meditation or a contemplation. He was inviting them to be silent, not just so they can have their own thoughts, which is, I think, how we moderns have done it. I mean, us modern liberal-minded Quakers, we tend to um, see the silence as an occasion for quiet pondering, thinking, ruminating about things, or at least that, that has been my experience, and that's how Quakers generally feel about it. But I noticed that in those early writings, the friends were told not to think, not to ruminate, not to imagine, but to go totally silent right to the core of their being and simply to be open. Well, that, of course, sounds just a little scary. I mean, are they really supposed to be open to whatever may come up? Um, all the nightmares, the guilt, uh, the negative feelings, the conflicts. Um, and that sort of worry has been with us for a very long time. I think it's part of the modern anxiety we've had for a number of years, hundreds of years. Certainly the Puritans at the time 
of those early Quakers, the dominant religious figures of that time, um, urged people not to uh, look at their own sins, except to ask Jesus to save them from their sins. They were helpless in face of all this, and they needed Christ to enter into them to resolve those questions. You'll be familiar with that kind of spirituality. But George Fox said, and this was another thing that surprised me there, that uh, when you go silent and all these dark memories, temptations, fears, anxieties, conflicts emerge in your mind, you don't brush them aside, nor do you let them drift away, as you know some meditators would suggest today. He says, look at them. Now that is that is surprising. I mean, it doesn't, it's counterintuitive, you might say. Um, if you've got troubles in your mind and they're coming from the depth, um, from all sides, surely opening yourself to them and looking at them is just making yourself more vulnerable. But no, that's where the silence and the stillness come in. He wrote to um, a very good letter to Lady Claypool, Elizabeth Claypool, who was the daughter of Oliver Cromwell, as it happens, and you can find it in his journal. Um, it's also my anthology of George Fox, which starts off. Now, she, incidentally, was rather depressed and anxious at the time. Um, very troubled so. And George Fox records this letter that he wrote to because he said, I heard that it did her much good and she was very grateful for it. And others have read it too. It is indeed a wonderful letter. It's the one that starts, you may be familiar with this opening line, be still and cool in your own mind and spirit from your own thoughts. And then you will feel the principle of God within thee to lead thee to God. Now, it's not a clear indication of a spiritual practice like we've been studying on this course. You know, there is the process. Be still and cool in thy own mind and spirit from thy own thoughts. You stop thinking you know, as it were, up here in your conscious mind. And then, and only then, will you feel a principle of God, the, the basic source of life um, to lead you up to God. So that was quite a, a, a significant breakthrough for me to understand what Fox was doing, but I, I still didn't understand what sort of, how that was supposed to work. And one of the things that really helped me to pin this down, because I have to say, Fox and the others, including Mary Pennington, Isaac Pennington, William Penn, they didn't spread it out, you know, as you would expect them today, you know, six stages, 10 stage process that you can follow. Um, there's no systematic process, lots of hints, summaries, implications. Um, and it's taken me quite a long time to piece together from their writings what this process was like. But I want to show you one text. And Marcel, can you put up Epistle 10 from George Fox? Because this um, tells us something rather important. Uh, I could show you many epistles like this, and I would urge you to read them. But this is one of the most impressive. Also, it's one of the most difficult to understand. And I've never come across anyone who did understand this. You'll see, now I'm going to read it, and you'll probably be, unless you, you've got second sight, you'll probably be as puzzled as I was about it. Some of it sounds very sort of modern and relevant, and others very weird. Whatever you are addicted to, the tempter will come in that thing. And when he can trouble you, then he gets advantage of you and then you're gone. Stand still in that which is pure after ye see yourselves, and then mercy comes in. After thou seest thy thoughts and thy temptations, do not think, but submit, and then power comes. Stand still in that which shows and discovers, and there does strength immediately come, and stand still in the light, submit to it, and the other will be hushed and gone, and then content comes. Your strength is to stand still after ye you see yourselves. 
<laughs> okay, now hands up those who understood what he's talking about there. It's, it's partly his language, isn't it? Um, he's, he's probably dictating this, and if he'd read it through afterwards, I'm sure he would have uh, redrafted it, but Fox never read things through afterwards. He never redrafted things. Uh, they stand there rather simply. A couple of people have thought that this must have been transcribed wrongly. It does not make sense. I mean, this, for example, um, stand still in that which is pure. That's the third line. After ye see yourselves and then mercy comes in. That, it does not. But if you tell yourself, if you've got the clue from reading other things about George that he is describing a process which he has discovered. This has not been taught to him in any way. He's discovered this as a process of meditation, which he has undertaken himself, and he's trying to get others. So you can see here um, that he's using the word after a lot. After ye see yourselves, after thou seest thy thoughts and then. Don't do this, but do that. Then power comes. So here's a, a process, a temporal process. And if you juggle it with a bit, you can see what he's saying. There are three steps to this process. See, stand still, and submit. It's quite easy to remember because they all begin with S. Um, you see yourselves, first of all. Now, what he means by that should be clear from other epistles when he says, for example, wait to the light, for the light will show you yourself. He has two rather brief definitions of the light, which I think are helpful for us because we tend to think of the light in other ways, um, either just a source of inspiration or um, maybe even reason, the power of thought. That's how Quakers a hundred years ago tend to describe it. Or maybe the light at the end of a tunnel, you know, something to egg us on and inspire us. But George Fox said, the light um, is that by which you see yourselves. And with the light, a man comes to see himself or herself. In other words, it's a kind of awareness, a source of awareness, quite different from what we might expect um, from thinking about things, our normal consciousness. So in that strange sentence in the middle, after thou seest thy thoughts and the temptations, do not think, but submit. Okay, so we're not to think about these things. We're entering into another kind of awareness in the stillness, and whatever comes up, temptations, bad thoughts, um, memories, whatever they are, do not, Think about them, but just observe them carefully as they are and submit to the reality of what is happening. Then when you do that, but only when you do that, you accept the reality of what is happening, do you find that you've got strength? Um, and there, as he says on another occasion, there is the first step to be. So I think this, my translation of that text into modern English might help here, just to wind that up. This is a bit more than a translation, and somebody else pointed out it's more like a, a paraphrase, Rex. It's not a translation, but I, I'm trying to get those thoughts which I can see into clear modern English. So whatever it is you are addicted to, that's where the tempter will get you. And if he can trouble you there, he gets an advantage over you, and then you are finished. Of course, he's using the old biblical idea of the devil here, you understand, but in a metaphorical way, I'm sure. He's talking about our main vulnerability um, when we're really susceptible if we get tempted on one particular thing we're likely to give in. So see what's happening to you, what you are doing, then wait there in the light of what is pure in you, and you will find forgiveness. When you have See what's going on in your mind, the temptations there. Do not think, just submit to reality. You will then receive power. If you stand still in the light that exposes and reveals, you will find that strength is immediately given to you. So stand still in the light, submit to it, and all the rest 
will quieten down and disappear. You will then be contented. Your strength is to stand still once you have seen yourselves. Okay, um, Marcel, can I have that um, other text now? Because I think the question now arises, you know, how does that process actually work? Um, even if we recognize that there are different steps here, you know, how does it move from one to the other? How do you move from the kind of conflict and misery that he has described at the beginning to the contentment and confidence at the end, even the power, the power it means to do what you really want to, to live as you really want to? Well, it took me a long time, I must say, to discover that process myself to understand how it worked and part of that was actually following what George was saying I, I broke it down I made, drew up a whole list of uh, guidance from his writings part of that went into the uh, the anthology um, the truth of the heart but the most important thing for me was actually to try and put it into practice so I went still myself and silent um, and allow whatever came up to, to come up and to look at it in that detached way, keeping a distance and not getting involved with it, being still and cool in my own mind from my own thoughts, suspending judgment, we might say, just seeing what there is. What is this image? What is this idea? What is this feeling I have? And in that quiet way, to look at it. So um, I was able then to summarize that process in four steps which you will see will be the basis for the meditation that we'll under, undertake in a minute and here's the first one marcel's put it up there right and um, we just have a couple minutes for this part rex okay um i'm getting near to the end of my 20 minutes am i yeah okay so very quickly uh Mind delight is the first. I'm using phrases that they themselves use. So that means pay attention to the kind of awareness that arises when you are still and silent. And that means not to your normal awareness. You're letting a different kind of awareness emerge by stopping thinking and all that activity and going into a very receptive mode. Um, that's the beginning, very passive. But rather different to the other meditations we've been looking at, aren't they? Which involve quite a bit of activity, control, direction, advice, support. This is briskly open, simply open. The assumption is that you already have within you what you need to know, what you need. To, you just have to give it your attention and open yourself to it. Now, the second slide, um, Marcel. There's the second step. Open your heart to the truth. Be open to whatever is shown to you of the truth of your life, however unfamiliar or uncomfortable it may be. What we're looking then for in order to find this breakthrough is what is really happening for us as human beings. The truth of what we are doing, thinking, feeling, how we have lived, planned our lives, how we have failed or succeeded, we're not looking just to see what's bad. We're looking for the whole thing, the whole reality of it. Um, and that, that requires a bit of courage. Um, that's why it's not enough, I found, just to sit in meeting and open your mind to whatever thoughts come to you. If you open your heart and you, you see maybe that what the terrible things happening in the world at the moment, which are overwhelming and disturbing, um, then to take that in, you need a certain discipline of um, letting go what you think, what you respond, so you can see it as it is. Okay, step three. Now, that was puzzling to me at first until I realized that it takes time for the light to illumine us. Um, because we soon discover, actually, when we accept that, yes, those are things I said and did, that's what I felt, those are the problems I have, that the picture begins to change as we accept it. For example, 
that's what I did, but it's not what I really wanted to do. That wasn't the real me. I, I was clearly in a bad mood. I was, um, I was uh, uh, deluding myself or something like that. Um, and I can, that way I get to see a much bigger picture of what I am and can do and can be. Um, and that applies then to other people and that applies to the world. Once you accept the bad and don't exclude it from your consciousness, you get a much more wholesome sense of yourself, your distinctive self and what you can now do to make things better. And the last uh, step, submit to the truth, which might sound a bit hard. Uh, that word, of course, is their, is their word. I would say, this means accepting the reality. It doesn't, you're not submitting to a person. Uh, and so um, it's not that kind of subjugation of myself. It's simply accepting fully the reality that has come to me. But what comes to me as I open myself in the light might be quite different from the way I think about myself. Well, it's likely to be. That's the whole point of doing this meditation. It's, we're not just confirming what we always know. We're really trying to find out what's going underneath the surface. That is, underneath the ways we normally think and talk about ourselves and one another, which are all very helpful and practical up to a point, but they're governed by that self-interest or anxiety, which slightly distorts everything. That's where the, um, the light is so important for us. So then when we see ourselves home, we're aware of our, deeper connectedness with others and indeed with God, then we know what we have to do and we feel we have the power to do it. So in the next part of this program, then that works, that's all for now. Thank you, Marcel. In this next part of the program, we're going to go through that process in a way that I've tried to make a bit more accessible um, by recognizing some of the difficulties we might have, for example, asking you a question about your life as a sort of prompt for the meditation, but suggest you don't try to answer it yourself. So that helps you to be still and cool and not to engage actively with the questions, the issues which will come up. And I think you'll find that in 40 minutes, that sort of process is possible. Although it's best then to follow that period of um, meditation um, with a time of um, absorbing what has happened in that time, maybe writing a journal or drawing a picture or just going for a walk and letting it all soak in. This is, you know, letting yourself submit to the truth, accept what is happening, if indeed it does come to you as the truth of your life. Um, so we're going to have 40 minutes for the guided meditation and Marcel is going to read six prompts <laughs> which take us through those four steps in a, in a slightly different language, a, a kind of modern language, but you'll recognize that process. And then afterwards we all have, I think it's 10 minutes, isn't it, Marcel, we've arranged for, for you to write notes, journals, or go for a walk, get a cup of tea and just absorb what happened and then to come back and join a group where you can share what happened if you want to as much as you want to um, before you come back to this plenary and then you might want to say again after further reflection what happened in that meditation for you not what others happened happened to them or what you think about it but just what happened in that meditation and what you now make of it. And then, well, I think we'll all find this very helpful. Okay, I might have gone on a bit there, Marcel, I'm afraid. Um, that was a little longer than we expected. Um, I wonder if there are any um, sort of essential questions before I, I guide the meditation. Yeah, I do want you to be clear about that. So if it's really, if there are any questions for clarity, it might be good to ask them now. We don't see any hands up. Looks like people are ready to settle in for the meditation. 
Okay, thumbs up. All right, so I am going to be reading the prompts for this meditation from uh, Light to Live By. There are five or so different variations of this meditation that are all in the back of the book. Uh, there are also additional uh, variations of the meditation which are on the website for Experiment with Light, and I'll put that um, that URL up at the end of our time today. Um, so this, this meditation takes 40 minutes. As Rex said, I'll read six different prompts with a period of silence between five or six or seven minutes of silence between each prompt. Um, you want to be relaxed but alert. Have your spine straight if you can. Some people can lie down and still stay awake, but some people can't. <laughs> so make yourself comfortable. Relax body and mind. Start by making yourself perfectly comfortable. Feel the weight of your body on the chair or the floor. Then consciously release the tension in each part of your body. Then let all your immediate worries go, all your current preoccupations. Relax your mind so much that you give up talking to yourself in your head. Let yourself become wholly receptive.
In this receptive state of mind, let the real concerns of your life emerge. Ask yourself, what is really going on in my life? But do not try to answer the question. Let the answer come. You can be specific. What is happening in my relationships, my work, my meeting, in my own heart and mind? And more specifically still, is there anything here that makes me feel uncomfortable, uneasy? As we gradually become aware of these things, we are beginning to experience the light.
Now focus on one issue that presents itself. One thing that gives you a sense of unease. And try to get a sense of this thing as a whole. Deep down, you know what it is all about, but you don't normally allow yourself to take it all in and absorb the reality of it. Now is the time to do so. You don't have to get involved in this problem again or get entangled with the feelings around it. Keep a little distance so that you can see it clearly. Let the light show you what is really going on here. What is it about this thing you can ask that makes me feel uncomfortable? Let the answer come. And when it does, let a word or image also come that says what it's really like, this thing that concerns me.
Now ask yourself, why is it like that? Or what makes it like that? Don't try to explain it. Just wait in the light till you can see what it is. Let it, the answer come. If you get a simple answer like, because I'm afraid, or because that's the way she is, ask again the question why. Why am I afraid? Why is she like that? Let the full truth reveal itself, or as much truth as you are able to take at this moment. If you are really open and receptive, the answer will come.
When the answer comes, welcome it. It may be painful or difficult to believe with your normal conscious mind, but if it is the truth, you will recognize it immediately and realize that it is something that you need to know. Trust the light. Say yes to it. Submit to it. It will then begin to heal you. It will show you new possibilities for your life. It will show you the way through. So however bad the news seems to be at first, accept it and let its truth pervade your whole being.
As soon as you accept what is being revealed to you, you will begin to feel different. Even bad news will seem strangely good. Accepting truth about yourself is like making peace. An inner conflict is being resolved. Now there is peace. Your body may respond quite noticeably to this change. A sense of relief may make you sigh or want to laugh. Your diaphragm may heave. This is the beginning of changes that the light may bring about. But if none of this happens on this occasion, do not worry. It may take longer. Notice how far you have got this time and pick it up on another occasion. In any case, this is a process we do well to go through again and again so that we continue to grow and become more like the people we are meant to become.
when you feel ready, open your eyes, stretch your limbs, and bring the meditation to an end. At this time, we have about 10 minutes for writing in a journal or any other way that's useful to you to take in what you've experienced. You may want to get up and walk around as you do that, but some way to be with your experience, take it in. At the end of that 10 minutes, there's an opportunity to go into breakout groups with three other people. So small groups of four people in which you'll be able to share your own experience of the meditation, whatever you want to share, without interpreting anybody else's experience. Then we'll come back in the last 20 minutes of our time together. We'll hear from some people about your experience, and we'll hear final uh, thoughts and uh, responses from Rex. So if you are someone who doesn't want to be part of a small group, this may be a time to get off the line and come back in half an hour for the final 20 minutes. The slides are available and also um, the slides of the, of the PowerPoint and the recording, both video and audio recording will be available later. Welcome back, friends. We're going to have a little bit of time um, to hear from a few people. But first, I just wanted to share these resources on Experiment with Light. Um, the first is Rex's wonderful little book, Light to Live By. Um, has a different cover than this now. Um, and the other is the online website for Experiment with Light, which has many resources. It has links to um, recordings, videos. Uh, you can sign up to get a, a newsletter about people sharing their experiences. You can sign up, you can find uh, information about online uh, experiment with light groups. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful resource. So we have time for just a little bit of, um, just a little bit of sharing about your experiences. Remember that you're not going to share anything about what you heard anyone else say, just about your own experience. But what Rex would like to do is he'd like to hear from a few people about your experiences, or if you have a question, listen to several people and then give some responses. Yeah. So if, if you would like to speak, um, Raising your electronic hand would be helpful. I do want to remind you that we're recording and that if you do speak um, and you have your video on, your face will be showing, and that's entirely up to you whether you want that or not. So Mary Beth. I think what's so amazing and blessed about this is um, how the truth sets you free. You know, you really do um, feel different as Rex put it and um, the light to live by. And where that comes from is um, not to get all woo woo, but it's kind of miraculous, right? Absolutely, thank you. Rhea? Uh, I just want to comment. Uh, I have known about your work, Rex, for many, many years uh, and have read your book and I have the CD to guide me through the session uh, and have never succeeded with it until today. Uh, and I realized what I was missing was the relaxation, the first step. I was trying to get somewhere without doing that. Uh, and the relax, I found too, I had to go back to relaxing frequently in the process. It wasn't a one-time shot, but thank you very much for enlightening me. That's a wonderful insight. Mary Pags? Hi. Um, as is often the case, guided meditation is a wonderful 
wonderful thing for me. And at times it is more wonderful and more engaging than other times. I don't know a better word than engaging. I think that it is often the voice of the person who is doing the guiding. And Marcel, I think that's what it was here. As I was going through the steps, all of the prompts, what happened at the end when the, the one piece that I had to, that I had to look at, I didn't cry, but my eyes became so welled up that the tear was just streaming down. And it was what never happened before. And I, I, I uh, was able to, you know, get where I needed to go. And I do thank you. Mm, thank you for sharing that. Is there anyone else who'd like to share something briefly? Richard S. Yes. Um, I shared with uh, <clears throat> my group some some questions that that came to me, and maybe uh, perhaps Rex could could address one of them. Uh, is it possible to go into uh, an experiment with light with a predetermined question? Um, if, a, if a group is concerned about a particular individual or concerned about a particular situation, can, can this uh, experiment be used to, to address that? I'm sure Rex will have an answer, but we're going to hear from a couple more people first. Uh, Amy? Yes. Um, echoing a friend that spoke before me, I was lucky enough to um, become aware of Experiment with Light a while ago, and I've come back to it, and I've tried to use it many times, and um, really today really underscored the, um, the value of doing it with other people. And the value of you know Marcel's calming voice, you know, walking us through it. Um, so I just wanted to give thanks for that, and also um, not necessarily in order. Um, Rex, uh, you being able to explain more like the provenance of it, and you know how you how you uh, pulled this together. And explaining some of those basic concepts right up front really just made it so much more powerful. Um, and I'm still working on knowing when my voice, when 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 the chatter is mine, and when it's divine. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. Carrie. Hi, uh, thank you, Marcel. Um, so Rex, I enjoyed hearing from you and thank you for coming. And um, we hear at the beginning sometimes of our sessions, the chants of Paulette Meyer. And I just wanted to lift that up for everybody, but especially our friends who are located in Britain because you might be less exposed to Paulette's work. But I think that you would just find that it fits in with what we did. Um, and I wanna make sure that I mentioned to everybody that Paulette released a second CD of Quaker Chants last summer. So now there are two. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add a note that Paulette's CD, Timeless Quaker Wisdom and Wild Springs of Life used many of the quotes that Rex, um, Rex identified in Truth of the Heart. Uh, Paulette did take that five day uh, experiment with light workshop at Pendle Hill with Rex and was very inspired by that. So it was part of the creation of her chance. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more person since you're all being so concise. Rex, I don't see any other hand. So would you like to give a response? Yeah, okay. Well, it's very encouraging to hear those responses from you, especially those who've done it before um, and finding still there's more to be gained from it. Um, and I would agree, I think doing it with um, others is um, a great help. Um, it's simply the presence of others makes a difference. 
but uh, let me just get the gallery pictures. Um, the others being present while you do it makes a difference. There's a kind of uh, synergy or something which we don't probably understand well, which helps us to relax and focus and have confidence in the process. And I think confidence is a lot to do with this because obviously going deep in this way can be a bit scary. It does, it's a bit edgy. It's, it's not what we modern people do normally, at least not without some professional to guide us carefully step by step. So this is courageous territory, um, but it's wonderful when you do make progress. And as one of you said, you find you have this extraordinary gift latent within yourself uh, to open up your life and see it more clearly and know what to do. It, it's so it's so obvious, it's so natural. Um, everybody seems to have this capacity. Why are we so slow to, to pick up on it and to uh, draw on it? Um, and look how it brings us together and gives us uh, mutual understanding. I think um, that's pretty remarkable. Um, a couple of comments, though, on, on particular questions. Um, one was about whether you can bring a question into, consciously bring a question into a, a meditation beforehand um, and not just rely on what happens to come to mind at the time. I think, from my experience anyway, the important question is whether that issue is real for you whether you really do feel it in yourself. It's a genuine question and not, let's say, just a piece of curiosity or a cynical question or um, a question you don't really want an answer to. This process does seem to depend a great deal on our intention and what Marcel has said herself in the course of the, these uh, studies um, on the intentionality what you are directed to, what you're really committed to in your life, what you're seeking most deeply. That, I think, is where um, we encounter the light. And if we don't have that deep sincerity, then nothing will come up from that depth, nothing from the light anyway. Um, I don't know quite why that is, but clearly there's some important correspondence between our intentions, our feelings, and conscious needs on the one hand, and the response of the divine light within us. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and perhaps that's linked with another question about relaxation. One of you said you discovered how important it is to relax completely, which means, of course, letting go of the normal habits of thought and discourse in our head, um, which very naturally just run and run and run like um, you know, a video on loop, it just keeps going. Uh, and you've got to switch it off, which is not easy. And I think a good part of what we're learning in this course is how to allow that deeper spiritual process to get going, to turn off the switches of thought, imagination, memory, fear, ambition, whatever it is. Uh, that's occupying our mind. Even the, the normal things, just like, you know, the, the, the day's activities. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's um, all I wanted to say. Yeah, Paulette Meyer indeed was at that course that um, Marcel referred to, and that was the beginning of her concern. And then years later, she sent me this recording of Fox's words set to plain song. And it was a marvel, absolute marvel. And some friends got her to come to England and Lancaster. And so I met her just about a couple of years ago and she did some uh, work with us, sharing these songs and getting us to participate. A great, great piece of ministry. So thank you. I don't, do you want to add something, Marcel? To that. I just want to say thank you, Rex, not only for today, but for all of your, your decades of work, for all of your books, for creating Experiment with Light and Light Groups, and for all of your travels to share it with friends uh, around the world. I, I know it's been a blessing to many, many people and will continue to be into the future. So thank you. I know as an academic, at the time you first did it, it, it required 
a lot of courage to create this and share this. Thank you.